Greetings, and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Bob Dillon, President and CEO of Main Street Equity, a TSX-listed real estate company with a market cap of approximately $2 billion. Main Street Equity is based in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, with assets over $3 billion and over 17,000 rental apartment units across Western Canada. For over 20 years, Mr. Dillon and Main Street has provided consistent year-over-year double-digit returns to investors through Main Street's continued organic growth. Mr. Dillon is also the owner of National Payments, a Visa and MasterCard-approved merchant processing business in the financial services sector. In 2018, Mr. Dillon gifted $10 million to the University of Lethbridge towards the creation of the Dillon School of Business. Mr. Dillon was also appointed as Officer of the Order of Canada, has received the Queen Elizabeth and Diamond Jubilee Medal, was appointed Honorary Consul General of Belize for Canada, was awarded Entrepreneur of the Year for Prairie's Real Estate and Construction by Ernst & Young, received the Top 25 Canadian Immigrant Awards from the Royal Bank of Canada, and was awarded Alberta's 50 Most Influential People by Alberta Venture Magazine. Mr. Dillon also sits on numerous boards, including the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, Alberta Investment Management Corporation, Advisory Council for the Canada India Business Council, and the Invest Alberta Corporation. Mr. Dillon also holds an MBA degree from the Richard Ivey School of Business at the University of Ontario. Among other things, we sat down and discussed 19% interest rates, building a real estate business, and why Canadian home prices are rising. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Galatea Technologies. Galatea is a software company based in Calgary that is focused on helping producers better manage their fluid logistics. Galatea enables field operators and truck drivers with the ability to make the optimal decision on every waste, water, or clean oil load resulting in 20% savings on trucking and disposal costs. The Galatea platform makes it easy to create digital truck tickets, manifests, and shipping documents that automatically flow through the field data capture and finance systems. Galatea's platform is used by over 50% of Canadian producers, 600 trucking companies, and hundreds of disposal locations. Visit GalateaTech.com to learn more about how to optimize that last line on your lease op. This podcast is brought to you by Energy United. Energy United is an organization with a mission to promote practical energy policy across Canada. Energy United is building a community of Canadians that are passionate about Canada's natural gas and oil industry and are willing to take action. Energy United is driving change on issues that matter all the way from the carbon tax to the emissions cap. Join Energy United to make a difference at energyunited.ca. This podcast is sponsored by headracingcanada.com. In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is now offering free shipping on European factory performance ski gear. By passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers, HeadRacingCanada.com offers the lowest pricing available in Canada. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your new ski gear for the season. Good morning, Mr. Bob Dillon. Thank you very much for doing this. Just call me Bob. Thank you, Trevor. I really appreciate your time. I know it is valuable, but I think a lot of people out there will appreciate your insights. So I got lots of time for guys like you, or entrepreneurs, and who are trying to add value to society. And alternative media is the way we have to go to get insights on from you, me, Albertans, Canadians. So I have lots of time for you. Alongside your success, you were kind of a democratic slash man of the people type. For instance, your company's name, Main Street. Have you always had that aspect to your character? Main Street is the most famous street in all North American cities. And what I am providing is affordable mid-market housing for the workforce, millennials, new immigrants, international students, domestic students. And so that's why it is, you know, Main Street. and what he called cater to the average Joe. Similar characteristic to a few of the guests on the podcast from Calgary. Maybe it's a uh, Calgary thing, but I uh, appreciate it. So I thought for the purposes of today's conversation, we could structure it around you and Main Street and maybe get into some current events in real estate and whatnot. I'm all yours, Trevor. Whatever you want to ask, I'm here. 
raw, unedited. You got me. To start from the top, maybe, what is Main Street Equity for the listener? Uh, thank you for giving Main Street a plug. First of all, most people don't know it's it's an Alberta success story. We've achieved double-digit growth compounded year after year for the last 20 years, one of the best companies on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And our business model is mid-market ad value Western Canada. We are in the apartment building business. We provide housing for middle-class Canadian. We create value and a better affordable quality of life for middle-class Canadian. Majority of the buildings, over close to 80%, are smaller in size. Uh, institutional capital does not go into smaller buildings, like 30, 40 apartment units. What it does is focuses on the bigger complexes. So we've got this unique niche, smaller buildings. Now, all the buildings in Western Canada are like 40 to 70 years old. So they all need tender, loving care. So we buy these buildings, reposition them, increase the top line revenue, Fixed cost business flows to the bottom line, rinse and repeat. And we've created some unique inner city clusters focused on the millennial, immigrant, student living. So that's a clustering program which has become uh, – actually, we're going to be remembered for not our successes because of uh, the clustering program because the density – changes, which is the only leverage the municipalities have, is the density changes that they are proposing. And what that makes is makes our buildings, a land underneath, eventually worth more than the cash flow. So it's a very unique cycle time in Main Street that we've been um, subconsciously aggregating, planning, strategically investing for two decades. To Rewind the clock a little bit. How did you get into real estate? You know, Trevor, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy surviving in Calgary during the recessionary years of late 80s and early 90s. I couldn't get a job. It was a tough grind. So I started flipping homes. And you said, well, where'd you get the money from to flipping homes? I would be like, right now it's expensive. But those days, the houses a flip was 32000 And there was a lot of debt available. And it was the whole city was in foreclosure. That's an exaggerated term. But we bought these boarded up houses, you know, got a partner, got an equity partner, got a working partner, flipped a couple of homes. I was like in my in my late nineteens, early twenties, flipped them, made eighteen thousand bucks, all the money in the world then in early nineties, and that was it. I doubled down from those that nineteen thousand dollars. I haven't taken any chips off the table. And right now we over $3 billion, close to 18,000 apartment units, $420 million in liquidity. Our stock is $183 this morning. It is a um, phenomenal business model that rinse and repeat, add value, mid-market in Western Canada. And at the same time, we improve the life of middle-class Canadian. You're also a pretty interesting person. And you were born in Japan, if I'm correct. And That's right. I was born in Japan. My dad was born in Hong Kong. My roots are 100% Sikh from both sides of my family, mother and dad. My grandfather was based in Hong Kong, and then my dad was based in Japan, and then they were in Liberia, West Africa. Then the Civil War broke out in Li Liberia, and my parents lost everything, and they came here as economic refugees. Canada was open to immigrants, and after the Civil War psychological trauma my parents went through, it was only logical for them to go to a safe country. And they came here and it was great. But my challenge, my dad, and more so my dad and my mom faced, is the skill set wasn't transferable. Just like doctors driving cabs, right? You know, this movie's made out on docky cab where the skill set wasn't transferable. So it was a tough grind for my, my parents, but they uh, sacrificed their life for us. My dad died a few years ago. My mom is still alive. And so they came from Liberia as economic refugees. They had no money and they lost all their financial resources. They came here and they started their life again. And we were kids. Canada has been great. We are part of the Canadian fabric. It doesn't mean that there's not challenging times, but I feel Canadian. That's more important. It must have felt like North Pole at the time, coming to uh, minus 20, minus 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's better than getting shot. Right. Um, you haven't had to work for a while. What motivates you nowadays? You know, you, you, just, you just don't think about it. I really enjoy what I do. It's not work. 
I'm providing a niche in the market that the investment community and and the guys who use our product, our customers are saying thank you for giving us renovated suites and improving the life of middle class Canadian. There's a self of achievement and the financial resources you get with it, you allocate them in philanthropy. So at every angle, it's been fantastic. Canada's been great. Calgary's been great. I hope Calgary never changes. It was an open society. It was a meritocracy. meritocracy. I hope it doesn't change. When that starts changing, then we become like the private clubs of Toronto and Upper Canada College. Ah, I would hate that. I was fortunate to ride the wave of this unique Calgary culture. I don't think it existed anywhere else in the world. Anywhere in the world, where engineers from Saskatchewan can come and build massive oil companies, where engineers from Calgary build massive oil companies, where immigrants like me, first generation, first gen, go out there, build multi-billion dollar companies. Where do you, where do you get this? A lot of guys talk about the success of United States and, you know, we can come and make it. I think Calgary was, is, is been an amazing story. Just in the real estate world, in my long cycle of last 30 years in real estate, I've seen lots of self-made stories from as low as watermark of $5 million to billionaires and not 10 or 20. I'm talking about hundreds of people who made it in the real estate. Now, I'm not in the oil and gas, and it's a similar story in the oil and gas. And it was a unique culture of Calgary. Please, young entrepreneurs, don't lose this great city of ours. It is a unique ecosystem. It's a unique culture. Yes, we can attitude. And that's, you don't have to promote this. It's built in our subconscious. It's everybody is raised with it. So you don't have to go to consultants or therapists or go to these public speakers and charge you thousands of dollars and motivate you. We are born motivated. We are raised. It's in our DNA. It's in our fabric. Many years ago, I was criticized in one of the national papers on making this comment, and I'll repeat it. A kid grows up in Toronto. He wants to work for the top six banks. A kid grows up in Calgary wants to be an entrepreneur, yeah. just like you, Trevor. Like I just saw your business model in e-commerce and the skiing thing. I think it's fabulous. I bet you nobody else is doing this anywhere else except here in Calgary yeah. because we have this attitude. Yes, we can. Headracingcanada.com. For yeah, anyone I'm look it up as soon as <laughs> you've done this podcast that I'm enjoying so much. Um, when I was preparing for this conversation, I was watching some of your videos on, online and one of the comments that stuck out was your attitude that you had nothing to lose and that was your kind of perspective going into business. How important do you think that was to your success in life? One thing unique about immigrants, no different than me, is the mentality of an immigrant is if I'm going to uproot myself wherever you come from, and take a risk into a new nation, you're basically a risk taker. Now, you don't have to build a multi-billion dollar organization and have 20 geographic location and hit double digit returns. You could be a house builder and a small merchant. You're a risk taker. Or you could just be an investor, right? So that's the attitude of immigrants. Just mad. Look at where we came from. Look at where we are. We're not going to starve. You don't know what poverty means. You really don't. You know, the only people who complain about Canada are Canadians. we got the greatest nation in the world and Calgary is the greatest city in the world. Mm -hmm. You kind of touched on it, but do you remember your first house that you built? Yes, sold? Sonalta, two houses. It was a foreclosure. We picked it up. I, I vaguely remember the address, but we still have the same lawyer who did the transaction. Uh, I, I got to tell you the story. We didn't know what we were doing. We fixed up these two houses and this very seasoned real estate broker came to us like, like at that time he was like 70 years old, whose son-in-law, by the way, is still a shareholder of Main Street. He comes to us and says, I'm going to help you kids out. I'm going to sell this to two famous flippers at that time. Now it's popular on TV shows flipping, but those days these guys were real genuine. But he also said, you know what? I'm going to get you a lawyer who's really cheap. He'll do both sides of the deals. Those days, lawyers could do that. <laughs> and he he did both sides of the deals. Um, and he's still a shareholder on Main Street. 
30 years later, and a board of director of Main Street. So I don't mind mentioning his name because he that's public information. But it was a good experience, it sounds oh, like. We made money. In 19 or 20, we made 18 grand. And that was my first two deals. And and all the guys on my first deal are still partners, shareholders, lawyers. They're all still involved with us. People is a long game. Oh, by the way, the lawyer's name is Joe Amanti at Warren Tetenser. Um, in your mind, do you remember when Main Street really started to take off? When you weren't just maybe flipping houses anymore? It was starting to become a major corporation? It hasn't taken off yet. Main Street's foundation is today. We are about to launch because what Main Street didn't have all these years is an operating platform, technology, capital, lines of credit, credibility, 20 geographic locations. You got to look at a cycle time on multifamily. What is unique secret sauce on a macro level is replacement cost. It costs you, let's say, 350000 to four hundred, depending on whose numbers you look, on building a brand new apartment building. We buy them anywhere between one hundred dollars to $150,000 a door. Why is that relevant? There's a supply-demand imbalance. So there's 2.2 million apartments in Canada, from Prince Edward Island to Victoria. The whole country, purpose-built apartments at 2.2 million. Vacancy is like 1.5%. Let's say it's zero. And the population growth in 2023 was 1.5 million between PR, foreign workers, international students, and refugees. So you got zero vacancy or very low vacancy, and you got this tsunami of people coming to Canada. So if there's demand for your toques here, what do you do? You just manufacture more. You can't manufacture more apartments till rents go up considerably. And 73% of all Canadians make less than $50,000 a year. But let's say that happens. Let's say rents double. Every shareholder of Main Street would have done really well if that happens. Let's say the rents double, where the developer says, well, now I made, there's economic justification to create new product. Then you got a cycle time of five, six, seven, eight years. Who knows how long? Then you got density. Then you got zoning. Then you got financing. Then guess what you got? All the bureaucratic hurdles. Then you got tradesmen. I don't see a plumber's son being a plumber. A plumber's son's a banker. He's a code, he's, he's developing software. He's not building, he's not a plumber. So where are we going to get the plumbers, the drywallers, the carpenters, the painters? Who's going to build these apartments? Right? So we had a very unique cycle time where we decide, hey, no more immigrants, no more foreign students. We got aging demographic and we got everybody falling off a cliff and we got, we're going to have nobody working in this country and pay the tax base for the seniors who need the health care and the tax base to survive. What do we do? How do we create affordable housing? Now, fortunately, Main Street shareholders are going to do really well in this cycle. You started out flipping houses, but the transition to a corporation, TSX listed company, what led to that transition and, and why'd you do that? You know, that's a really interesting story. When we went public, like there was a program called the JCP. Now, now it's called CPC. Basically, you know, for a little bit, very little money, you can get listed on the venture exchange. And then after you prove yourself, after you build an asset base, you go out to and get it on the TSX. And so, Real estate was a capital intensive business. So if it's a capital intensive business and if you want a scalability and we have a unique niche in the marketplace, you go out there and tap into the market. So we went public. Now we are a corporation, not a REIT. There's a, there's a fundamental difference. So the day we went public, somewhere around year 2000, the real estate index crash. Then the Asian bubble happened. Then the tech bubble happened, right? And capital was sucked out of the market. And I'm an orphan out there swimming in this massive ocean. Please, somebody, what do you call, give me a hand. Then there's a new phenomena that came in called the REITs. And there was 20 corporations, and I was one of the corporations, where real, now let, let, I want you to pause there for a second. History of real estate was in the hands of entrepreneurs, family offices, real estate guys, 
small syndicators, we didn't have this aliens called REITs. What is a REIT? Financial guys who want to gobble up real estate in this, every sector, multifamily, commercial, warehouses, you know, storage, everything is getting consolidated, financialized in real estate. So what was unique about the REITs? They had endless capital. So we, we saw the first wave and said, ah, it's over. Like, what is this? Second wave, third wave, fourth. Next thing you know, they run the real estate industry. So the shift happened from family offices like Reichman's and Trump before he was the president and other family offices. I'm not going to mention their names to companies. So I had a, I had a strategic decision to make at that time. Do I become a REIT or I am a value creator? So the difference is REITs distribute all their capital. Money comes in, money goes out, and uh, there are more financial engineers, less operators, less entrepreneurs, less creators of wealth. So there's like many, many REITs in every sector. And there was one corp. That's me. In theory, sounds good, right? If you want to invest your money, you got all these other REITs. I'm the guy that's different, and you should be putting a little bit of capital with me. But the problem was Bay Street bet on the REITs, and I was I was an orphan. So I got two choices. Privatize, sell out, become a REIT. I chose none of them. I said, I'm going to prove the market wrong because my business model works. So one from zero to over $3 billion in assets without any equity dilution. What little equity dilution we have it was created by my options that as a CEO I got. And we created the best performing real estate company in the universe and the history of mankind because the model works. How were you able to grow in a capital intensive industry as a corporation? Creating value means you're increasing your cash flow. Whenever you buy a building, you increase your cash flow. How do you grow a company when you need real estate, a capital intensive business and all the capital is flowing towards the REITs? Our secret sauce, our business model worked. So we increased cash flow, but our cost of capital was much higher. Today's a fancy word for loan sharks, but in the old days it was called, now, nowadays they call them mess lenders and equity lenders and this kind of lenders and that kind of lenders. But those days it was just pure loan sharks. And so we grew through loan sharks and those loan sharks are still shareholders of Main Street. Well, they weren't, they weren't like gangsters. They were just, uh, guys who charged more what he called interest rate on pools of capital. And one of them, he'll kill me if I call him a loan shark. Um, one of them is um, a significant shareholder of Main Street. To give the listener perspective, what kind of uh, rates are we talking about in that scenario? Oh, but don't forget those days, the rates were higher anyway, but I've borrowed as high as 18, 19% and made the numbers work. Uh, don't forget uh, three other variables that I haven't, you know, I got to drill down on is the institutional capital enormous amount of capital, was focused in Quebec and uh, Ontario, Ontario and Quebec. So there's less capital in Western Canada. Two, there was very little capital, institutional capital in mid-market space, smaller buildings. And they want to do big chunks of real estate. They don't want to do small chunks of real estate. And then there was very little capital for add value. Now it's popular. Don't forget, we started 20 years ago when it wasn't popular to what he call add value. Now you got the TV shows, I'm creating value, you know, house flippers, and I do a paint job and my, and this fixer upper. We were the originals. We were the pioneers. You know, we were the real deal. We weren't, you know, actors on, on TV shows right now. So, and the Calgary was going through a transition. Alberta was and Western Canada from deep recession, national energy plan, low commodity prices, exodus of people. And now, even the last go, last cycle downwards, we had a positive migration. So I, you know, I wrote an article so that trees have matured in Calgary. You know, when you make a subdivision, you plant these trees and so still looks pretty barren. And a few years later, trees look beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. Our neighborhoods look beautiful. There's lots of competition in real estate, but Main Street has succeeded. You kind of touched on it a little bit, but what made Main Street different and allowed you to succeed? Knowing your product, <clears throat> building infrastructure, 
building the pillars of our organization and respect, credibility, and it's a capital intensive business. So let me walk you through the four pillars. Pillar number one is, again, mid-market ad value Western Canada, Main Street value chain. Now we got the capital. We started out with mes lenders, but we got capital now. So that's a great competitive advantage where the seller says, I know if I deal with Main Street, he may not give give us a top price, but the deal will close. All right. Number two, we only buy distressed assets. So what that means is rough buildings that need a lot of work. So you got to have the construction know-how. You got to have the crews, the knowledge, and the supply chain logistics. We have a supply chain logistics right from Asia where kitchen cabinets come from factories to warehouses, no middlemen. Cost of renovation is significantly lower because of a supply chain logistics that nobody's been able to develop that we have developed factory direct. Three, after what you call the renovations done, you're going to need a deep marketing team, digital marketing, leasing agents, RM, branded products, where they go out there and rent these units out relatively quickly. Some of these are big complexes. And four, operating platform, customer service, maintenance, call centers, portal, everything to make the customer happy. Because most of these distressed assets get into distress because they don't have the fourth pillar. So to develop all these four pillars effectively, I mean, it's still a journey on perfection. It takes a long time. Yeah. And now we get in there. How did you spot the middle class opportunity? And how did you come to that conclusion? That was the best area to focus on. Did you just kind of stumble upon it? Or was there a master plan? Data mining. 73% of Canadians make less than 50000 a year. Foreign students are going to be renters. Domestic students, university students are going to be renters. New immigrants, small percentage, come and buy right away. Most of them are renters. Foreign workers, renters. It's all data mining. It's not intuition. I don't go to my psychic and say, hey, what's what's the next trend line? He says, we got full-time data mining. Where's a puck going? Which city is going? Which geographic location in the city is going through transition? Like, Bankview looks like San Francisco today, but when we were buying buildings in Bankview 20 years ago, it was a ghetto. It was a tough environment. Inglewood, believe it or not, number one municipality in Canada. We were picking up uh, houses there for $30,000. And Bridgeland, $30,000. It wasn't too long ago. Just a quick thank you to one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back to the show. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. Main Street's stock price is basically at an all-time high these days. So I guess the question is, from your perspective, why? I think Main Street stock was all-time high before because we didn't have assets. We didn't have cash flow. We didn't have infrastructure. You know, 80% of a lot of the S&P index stocks are evaluated on intangible assets. We get zero value of intangibles. What's happening with a population growth? What's happening with 44% of the population of millennials and Z cohort? The stock was all-time high for the last 20 years when we didn't have all the foundations and the wind behind us. Eight years of Alberta politics, pipeline fiasco, low oil prices. Right now, Main Street stock is cheap. How have you grown profitably in a capital-intensive business that requires equity? How have you thought about that to create value for your shareholders without giving away your secrets? We kind of touched on it a little bit with the four pillars, but i tell you one competitive advantage I have. When I started out in this business, Calgary was one-third of its size. 1.7 million population, then it was like five or 600,000. But there was still a lot of entrepreneurs. There were a lot of players. The real estate was at hands on individual entrepreneurs, family offices, etc. Now, nobody wants to get their hands dirty and buy a small apartment building and fix it up and and uh, look at the supply demand imbalances who wants to do that the profit sounds glamorous after the product is completed this beautiful building in 17th avenue where we own a whole block on 17th avenue looks great 
But to put the pieces of the puzzle together, nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to work hard anymore. But that's one thing good about the new immigrants. There's new wave of immigrants. They're going to work hard if we get the right ones. The thin line between speculation and investment, I read once that Sam Zell, for instance, preferred cash flowing rental apartments to buying on spec. How did you think about that with Main Street? Did you prefer rentals with cash flow up front or how did you manage risk in that sense? One of my mentors was Sam Zell. And he's, I got a letter on my desk. I want to show it to you that he uh, wrote to me. And his letter, he basically said, my story is yours. 20 years of double-digit returns, an office with no doors. That's in his book. Yeah. Here's a letter. Wow. He basically said- He just passed, too. Yeah, he just died seven months ago. I couldn't afford to speculate. I needed free cash flow. I needed a market that was growing. I was looking at an endless market and endless scalability. So speculation doesn't offer you that. Now, it's glitzy to buy Bitcoin. I get that. But- I buy today and I cash flow tomorrow. 18 month cycle time. Increase the top line revenue by 25 to 40%. Fixed cost business, everything flows to the bottom line. Easiest product within the real estate family that's financeable. And it's a demand. Like it's before your time. Remember eight track tapes? That technology went away. VHS, that technology went away. Now, I, we may find some technology that's going to eliminate affordable housing, but it's not coming in the next decade. Before we get into current events in real estate, you own a 3,000-acre island in Belize. I guess the question is, why did you buy the island in Belize, and uh, how did that come to be? Belize, I've written two books on Belize, doing business and retiring in Belize, and the Honorary Council General for the last 20 years. Just like apartments... Belize was underdeveloped, developing nation with great potential, English speaking, same land title system as Alberta, no squatter rights. And just like Canada, real um, rainbow of society from all over the world, but migrated there many, many years ago. And literally, most beautiful country in the world. How can you not buy 3,000 acres? Tell you, why aren't you on the WestJet nonstop flight to Belize? Belize is a small country, islands and mainland in Central America, and Alberta is a population of uh, four and a half million people. But there's a WestJet that connects us to Belize. And that tell you something? You don't have to listen to me. Why is WestJet connecting Calgarians and this hub to Belize? Because it is paradise. Population 440,000 people, tropical paradise, rainforests, beaches, best fishing, diving, second largest reef, largest live reef. It's just paradise deluxe. How does one buy an island? How does that come up? You, you only buy, you know, I'm a Sikh and my successful Sikh truck drivers always use this as a common and you've heard this before. I travel on the highway that's least used so I can maximize my mileage. So I went to Belize where WestJet wasn't flying nonstop, where it wasn't discovered, when it wasn't tourist Mecca and people didn't realize that it's got the second largest reef in the world and untouched islands and rainforests and toucans flying around and just a beautiful country. So you know, you got to be there first, and that's how you do it. Um, maybe to get into current events in real estate nowadays. From your perspective, why have real estate prices risen so much in Canada? That's a complex answer. It's not a simple one to blame all the immigrants and immigration. We have immigration all over the world, Australia, U.S., everywhere. But I'm going to, like a machine gun approach, I'll, I'll give you all the reasons. We are bureaucratic on zoning, permits, supply chain. We had a pent-up demand for two years of COVID. Real estate was flat and when it turned around, boom, it just took off. I realized some of the resort areas were hot during COVID days. We had a population boom. Like I said, 1.5 million people. We used to half a million people. All of a sudden, boom, we've got 1.5 million people. We had a supply chain inflationary thing, goods coming in from China. And so costs went up on new product, like instantaneously. But Post COVID, so it is. It was a perfect storm, and a bunch of things happened at the same time. And in in terms of Alberta, we had 
eight years of flat real estate prices due to low commodity prices, politics, pipeline, uh, lack of migration. And now people have discovered Alberta. I said, wow, you know, I make more money and my cost of living is less and taxes are less and I don't less and I don't have to commute four hours a day. Thank you. <laughs> right. Undervalued. So, yeah. So there's a little bit of a pent up demand, but the question is, how do we solve this pent up demand? One is I take this opportunity to learn for all the politicians, the bureaucrats, the bankers learn 25% of our GDP's real estate, learn the real estate industry. And so that never happens again. If you were to put your finger on maybe one of the levers to help solve the man, would it be interest rates? Would it be increased supply of construction, reducing bureaucratic red tape? What, what would you suggest? I, I build 33 dials to how to solve the present problem. It's too heavy to get into it. There's temporary solutions and there are density solution, which is a medium cycle. There is zoning density, immigration, not stopping immigration. It's getting the guys in. And which lender is going to risk financing on new supply when there's so much uncertainty? We're going to stop immigration. We have stopped international students. Interest rates are interim financing on construction is a lot different than financing long-term houses. So you're paying 6 7% for 8% maybe on interim financing. Who's going to risk the capital to help developers build new product? And there's no economic justification. But one thing we can all do is get out of the way. The entrepreneurs, the builders, the developers will create the supply. Just get out of the way. Let them do it. If you're going to wait two years for a building permit and you let another two million people in, how are you going to do that? So temporary legalized basement suites, alley homes, let people rent out, Uberize access capacity in housing. That means we've got empty spaces, the second floor you know, like I got to give Calgary credit for turning obsolete B office building into residential. That's Uberizing uh, real estate. There's lots of access capacity where you got these existing walls are already built. That brings the cost down. Now go back to what I said earlier. Replacement cost is detriment to bringing new supply. But if you got the existing walls already up and the land is free and you're changing mixed use, for affordability, legalize all the basement suite. You legalize basement suite, new house builders are going to build small suites or three suites on zoning instead on a, on the same single family lot. And it helps first time home buyers buy the house because he's going to use the revenue as part of his qualification. So it helps the first time home buyers. The builders will start building with one suites, two suites. We already have them in some other street. Interest rates have been going up. Although it's not historically high, they're higher than they were. It makes it harder for real estate companies to operate, but you have an advantage with capital in a sense. How do you view interest rates right now in terms of the business? Is it good for you or bad? I think it's um, good for Main Street for many reasons. If, you, if you're playing the long game, it's a countercyclical opportunity. We have very countercyclical buyers. When interest rates go up, market softens, and there's less buyers. So we take this opportunity to go gobble up assets. That's number one. Two, interest rates are high. It restricts new supply. That helps us who is in the rental pool. So we're countercyclical and it restricts the supply are the two big ones. Now, if you believe rates are going to come down in the future, the math is simple. Rates come down, values go up. So we're waiting for that opportunity for the values to go up again. So when you asked me earlier that Main Street stocks hit an all-time high, Main Street stock is cheap. <laughs> right. From your perspective, where do rates need to go? Do you think they should be higher, should be lower, or stay the same? I think the rates should be lower because it, a lot of the renewals, uh, I don't have the exact data in my head, are coming up in the next little while. Uh, it's been very painful for middle-class Canadians to... We can't pay our credit card bills, can't pay our mortgage payments. We're hit by inflation, grocery bills. And what what is the leverage central bank has is to drop the rates. And let's not 
talk about how opportunistic businessmen we are when the rates drop. Let's talk about Canadians. We can't afford the high rates right now. We can't. But what can we do? We got inflation. We can't let the inflation run away either. So, but we're in a very difficult situation, you know, for middle class Canadians. It's a tough, tough grind. I mean, my, my gut feeling is how they're surviving this tough time is through the credit facilities, credit cards and whatnot. And that's, that's putting more of a burden on middle class Canadians. They're going to come out of the other end of the tunnel, lots of debt and stress and personal pressures they go through. These are, these are not intangible issues that middle class Canadians are, that you don't know about. You know, heart attacks, stress and, and going to the hospital, marriage breakups and all the cracks in our foundation. You know, number one divorce rate is financial issues. So we, we are dealing with a lot of financial issues and which is resulting in health issues, mental health issues. COVID, they talk about COVID created mental health issues. This inflation's causing mental health issues. It's a social problem. Interest rates is a social problem. If you were asked to give advice to the government of Canada, one piece of advice in terms of the housing crisis, what would it be? I'm not smart enough to give anybody any advice, but I can tell you by the scars and the research. I just, this is my hobby. I don't know. You ski, I build case studies on real estate. So there is a lot of invisible supply. Like I said earlier, basement suite, alley homes, density within the homes, density near transit, the middle ground, zoning. We beat this to death. Access capacity is a big one. Like we converted B office space to residential. Why do we want to take access obsolete space? Cost base is very low or zero, and we can utilize that into affordable housing. But then when there's surplus of affordable housing, we got to have enough relaxed zoning. We can convert that back into warehousing or office space or hotels or whatever. You know, that's the flexibility in the planning department and, and the city council should be able to do. Ability to Uberize. You know, what? what is Uber? Think about it for one second. Sure, there's a lot of people who are full-time Uber drivers. But in reality, what Uber was designed is, I have a car that I've already invested money in, and before I go come to Main Street to work, I can do a couple of rides in the morning and a couple of rides after work, right? That subsidizes my car, my lifestyle, whatever. That's what access capacity Uberizing is all about. And that's what we got to do with real estate. Let people utilize their empty space. Cost drivers, Coding. Some of our coding uh, codes, building codes are obsolete. They were built a zillion years ago. Same as density. Then zoning was created. So guys on the inside track, we're talking early 1900s. Okay. Like I don't want you to think this is happening in Calgary today. These guys, um, were on the inside. So the created artificial value on the real estate, building codes, parking, density, access capacity, zoning, the London model, the uh, London, England, UK model was, you know, they took structures like this one, this building structures, and everything's paid for already, land structure. City gives us permission to build four units upstairs. Very simple, right? Prefab home, pluck them on top. Everybody does it in low density buildings, legalizing basement suites, first time home buyer financing, Innovative financing, taxation. Now they've done, they've taken one, you know, take GST on new supply, that kind of stuff. Leverage to small developers. I'm big on this small developers, which creates this whole construction industry. You know, these immigrants who come like after World War II, the Europeans came and they build these small apartment buildings because they build them. They knew how to build them in there and let them, let them go crazy. A new affordable product for the lenders. Improve the landlord. Act, if you're going to restrict Landlord Tenancy Act in the favor of the tenants, who's going to build anything? And, and it goes the opposite. Rents go up a bit because we've had eight years of inflation and the landlords want to recover some of their costs. Uproar happens. They change the Landlord Tenancy Act. Nobody buys apartments. It's deferred maintenance and we're turning our city into a ghetto. But cycle time, red tape, development fees, um, now, there's two other innovative things is on prefab. Like we keep 
incentivizing tech companies, incentivize prefab, relax import duties on prefab homes from out of the other countries. Maybe it's cost temporary, bring the duties down to zero. Three, immigration policy, foreign students in tech schools who want to be plumbers and drywallers. So we have this program for truck drivers, but we don't have for plumbers. Try to make sense out of that. Education and trade school, immigration I touched on, on trades engineering, new concept. So it's not only trade schools, it's architects, engineers, and civil engineers. It's a whole value chain. And that's about it. I've got like, uh, you know, there's one that really bothers me about BC. Now, this I'm going back to macro again. BC's got this agricultural reserve. 20% of lower mainland is got agricultural reserves. So downtown Richmond, you got blueberry farms. You got these condos that are selling for a million bucks and you got a blueberry farm. It's called an agricultural reserve. And the size of agricultural reserve is the size of the country of Israel that feeds 9 million people. How does that make any sense? The most expensive real estate in the world is got agricultural reserve in downtown Vancouver, not downtown Vancouver, Richmond and all these places. Uh, I think free market, mixed-use development, urban industrial zoning, BC Agriculture Reserve, and like uh, the Green Belt in Toronto. We we got to really rethink all this. But it seems like uh, we don't want to, nobody wants to give. Not in my backyard. You know, I'm building an <laughs> apartment building in my backyard. I don't want to let the immigrants in, right? But the university says, I need foreign students to balance my books. <laughs> so I get, Everything's kind of semi-polarized, so that's going to um, that's going to put us between a rock and a hard place. Thoughts on downtown Calgary? What would you do with the high vacancy rates? Do you have any suggestions on that? First of all, I believe Calgary's got the best inner city in North America. Let's think about it. You start off at Bridgeland, Sunnyside. You go across the river. You go into Eau Claire. Go up First Street. Go to Seventeenth Avenue. You go to Mission. Go to Marta Loop, Lower Mount Royal. Red Mile, you got East Village, connected with a Stampede Park, Inglewood, with 200,000 people short. We built the greatest inner city in North America, the size of a population of 2.5 million. And that's why we got so much re- empty retail space and empty parking lots and these condos that are not sold yet. We got the greatest inner city. You put two or 300,000 young people here, we'll kick Austin, Texas's ass. That's what I think. The empty office spaces, I guess, just a function of people again, same thing. Well, I, I like to give a plug in for city of Calgary. They did one thing right is to convert them into off- affordable housing. They should let them convert them into warehouses and green agricultural things, hotels. Zoning is a detriment. The entrepreneurs will create opportunities and gaps in the marketplace. It'll tr- take the stress opportunity and create wealth out of it. Get out of the way. Free enterprise. But I, if I was in city of Calgary, we have this unbelievable opportunity with in-migration of young people at colleges and universities uh, that are opening up. Dillon School of Business is opening up a campus in downtown Calgary. Great example. So you have a campus, you have residential, you have restaurants, you have higher tax base. So you got to think, how do we Expand the economy, not be inwardly thinking. Get out of the way. Roll the carpet for investors. Roll the carp- red carpet for innovative real estate entrepreneurs who are going to create your tax base. Do not restrict them. Don't treat them like this big, bad capitalists. How are you going to lift the economy of Canadians and eliminate deficits and increase your tax base? by lifting entrepreneurs, but not be segmented. Okay, we only like entrepreneurs who are in the tech coding business in the green energy. Everybody else we dislike. What created this? What created this anti-entrepreneurial sentiment? I don't know what created it. Yeah. One thing I talked about in the podcast before is if we could be a little bit more like Texas where you're open to that business in every sense of the word. You don't just pick favorites. I don't know if you look government's that way. <laughs> job is not to pick favorites. Yeah, exactly. They, government's job is to create yeah. an environment of investment. Canada has had a decrease in foreign direct investment. Fine. 
Make up your mind. Say we are a socialist country. That's it. It's over. We'll pack up our bags and go somewhere. Dubai, maybe. I don't know. You know what Dubai had? They ran out of oil, but they had a vision. You know what Hong Kong had in the 70s, right? A vision. It had nothing. So we're going to transform this place. You know what Singapore had? It was an opium den. They had a vision. If I was city of Calgary, my vision would be would be the number one inner city destination in the world because we got the makings for it. We got the bricks and mortars. We got the bridges, the rivers. We got it all. I would be banging on every door. Come to Calgary. To wrap things up, if you were starting out again in real estate or in business in general, 30-year-old Mr. Bob Dylan, what advice would you give that individual? Take action, take risk. Analysis, paralysis. Everybody's too educated right now and they're not taking any risk and they're analyzing everything to death. Go take a chance. You don't know the future. Nobody knows the future. You don't know what the return's going to be. You don't know if you're going to make money in this deal. Nobody knows. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, thank you. We'll uh, end the conversation there. Hello, listeners out there. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Hopefully the episode provided some insights. If you enjoyed the show, check out trose.ca where more episodes are yet to come. You can also subscribe to the podcast where your token of support is much appreciated. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. Oh,